and um, GS. Here's the thing. I went to Miami, so I'm crazy. Okay. <laughs> so you pretty much have PowerPoints for all those conditions? Can I have the two? Okay. Have okay. right, I had somebody ask me about what's in the GI section. I said, uh, okay. it's there. The PowerPoints are awesome. It has everything. Yeah. yeah. They go by the book. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's easy to read along. It's better. Information if you're doing the blog, you see it repeat itself there again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. So, um, the major issues that we have that you're going to cover here, because we did a lot of these uh, stuff that's in that GI section of the book, in MP2, because that was all the other diseases that we had in there, peptic ulcer disease, all that kind of stuff, you did in MP2. So now we're going to be talking about a little bit more of the other things that we look for in patients who have GI disorders. Not because all of them are so acutely ill, but a lot of times if you, the treatments and things surrounding them are the issue when the patient has a problem. So the first uh, section on uh, the GI section talks about uh, gastric cancers. And so we're going to be talking, about, in, in general, when you think about gastric cancers, people think, oh, it's just the stomach or it's just the esophagus. Most doctors in general speak to gastric cancers as being any of those places, but your symptomatology may be different, and then the management of the patient may be a little different. The bad part about GI cancers, especially when you're talking about gastric in the stomach or esophagus, they tend to be very, have a high mortality rate. You know, like colon cancer, we do screening for. These other ones we don't really do screenings for, it's just that people are complaining about something and we do some diagnostics and then see that they have a problem. The bad part about it as well is that the GI, GI tract is well um, uh, innervated and it also has a good blood supply, so a lot of times by the time the patient is diagnosed, they actually have meds which is one of the difficult things that kind of goes along with that. So gastric cancer is just telling you the stomach's actually in the stomach, uh, cancer is in the stomach itself. If it's esophageal, then that means it's just in the esophagus. The issue that you have or what you think about as far as risk factors for patients who have these disorders, like I said, they don't generally have symptoms early on. They tend to have them later in the context of disease and what happens with your patient. But early on, you don't really see symptoms going on with people. They tend to happen later. But one of the things that you look at is their history and then look at their um, different complaints that they're having right now. So a person who has stomach cancer usually has a history of alcohol abuse and smoking, okay, because those kind of things go together when you talk about gastric cancers. They accelerate that whole process by about 150 to 200 percent as far as me looking at literature that says that if you do both of those things together, greater risk for you having a problem. Esophageal cancer tends to, you'll see it more in patients who do have a history of GERD. That reflux of acid contents from the stomach causes some changes in the lower part of the esophagus and it changes it to what we call Barrett's epithelium. That Barrett's epithelium is a precancerous lesion in the esophagus. So when they see those in patients who may have GERD, so the doctor's doing that test, or you may be coming in because you have what they think is a peptic ulcer, so you're doing an e e EGD and that kind of thing, and they see those changes there that already predispose you to having cancer later. So that's the person they're going to follow more often, because normally you don't get EGDs every you know, year like you do with other things. But if you have a person that has those changes in the esophagus, they will get EGDs more often because they know it's a precancerous lesion. So your thing is if you know that person has that, get them to get rid of some of the other stuff that they do. To get rid of the smoking and the drinking. The other thing is eating a diet low in vegetables because those are things that they tell you lead to cancer. The other one is um, low. if you have low, low. I mean, it's, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, that's my diet. <laughs> if you eat a diet that, is, it, that you don't take in enough vegetables, okay. I should say. And then there's also some correlation between people who don't get enough calcium, even though they tell us that dairy is the devil. Uh, one of the things that they see as far as cancer in the colon and bowel sections is that patients who have a low diet, um, low calcium levels actually can have increased um, cancer rates. The other thing that you see um, associated with that is people who eat a lot of things that are smoked, cured, or have nitrates. That's why for the people in general, we talk about cancer rates of, of gastric cancers, 
tends to happen more in people of Japanese descent, and um, because that's the way they cook their food. A lot of them actually cook their food. They eat a lot of cured things you don't think about. Yeah. So those are people that actually have a higher rate of cancer than even you know us bad American people. So you'll see those kind of things happen. But early on, patients really don't have symptoms. They normally don't have anything until the tumor is enlarged or they start, it blocks something that is going on with the patient. So you may see someone that actually has some melanin, because remember, both of these structures are higher up. So if they're oozing a little bit of blood, that's going to actually come out of you dark. Because remember, if the GI bleed is lower, then you're going to have bright red. Anything that's coming from high up in the GI system allows blood to degenerate, and so that's why your stools get dark. So you may have that. And if there's a small amount of bleeding there, you're going to have all the signs and symptoms that go with anemia. Because the person's going to be tired, maybe pale in color. When you, and the thing about it is you kind of put it off. You don't really think anything's happening until you end up having a problem. But the bad part about it is, of course, this ends up being something that later on you start seeing weight loss. You see early feeling. They feel like they're full all the time. Or they may have difficulty swallowing. So those will be some of the later things you see with it. Like I said, the bad part about it is these cancers tend to be um, malignant and very aggressive once they start, you know, um, they start up. So the patient, by the time they find it, usually has meds. So it has good blood supply. You'll see seeding all over the abdomen kind of thing. We have patients who have gastric cancers. So what we end up doing, there are several things we can do, of course. The best case scenario is that, yes, they're going to go down, do an endoscopy of some type, and do a biopsy because that's going to be a definitive test to tell me whether or not this person has cancer. Because everything will be suspicious for until you get a biopsy that says, yes, this is cancer. The best case scenario is not a whole lot of stuff going on, no metastasis anywhere, but you have a cancer that is there, what we call cancer in situ. That means doctors go and resect it out. So that means you're going to go to surgery, you're going to cut out that section, and then, of course, we've got to do some things because you've got to... Um, either re-anastomose things together when there's a lot of cancer that is there, uh, and so that's what the issue becomes. If the person is actually even going to be able to eat on their own again, or do you have to put in a permanent tube for feeding, those types of things. Um, but the, the surgeries that they do for patients are divided, Bill Rock 1 and Bill Rock 2. They're talking about taking out particular portions of the stomach. And for that, when a patient gets that done, the issue is when you have a patient that comes back to you after this, is very carefully, you know, we don't do a lot of irrigation with their NG tubes because sometimes if you irrigate, you can actually uh, perforate where the doctor's done their surgery. So when the patient comes back to you, they're going to be NPO. They're going to have an NG tube. They take out part of the stomach, and it's different. The surgeries themselves talk about the percentage of the stomach that is removed and if the vagus nerve is cut. It's not so much you got to know. Uh, say Bill Rock 1 or Bill Rock 2, even if that's in the question, it's asking about the complication of the surgery itself. Because the, one of the things that can happen, because now you made the stomach smaller, it can't hold as much food, sometimes after surgery patients have problems with dumping syndrome. And that's something that will happen sometimes right after surgery and gets better as you go along, or if people don't learn how to manage it, it continues all the way through. So things they have to learn. Same kind of thing you hear about patients. This is just the, these surgeries themselves are the precursors of what we do now for gastric bypass. Because it's the same type, type of process, but now you're going for this one because you're taking out cancer. So it's a little different about why the patient actually had it. So they take out part of the stomach. So patients don't be NPO initially. Uh, don't ear, if they have bloody drainage from there, we kind of monitor it at first to see what's going on. But forceful irrigation of it, because you know that's normally what we do, irrigate it and then um, put it back to suction. If that happens, you need to notify the doctor. Because forceful irrigation of a patient who had this kind of surgery could end up perforating where they actually went in and anastomose things in the patient. Um, generally with this person, uh, one of the big things, especially if they lost a lot of weight, doctors may not do the surgery right away even though they find cancer. The main reason being, if you have a person who's lost weight, they're already behind the eight ball about getting better and healing. So sometimes doctors will send a patient home with a Dolpoff tube and TPN to gain weight. Because if you're better off nutritionally, you do better when the surgery is done. But if they didn't do that, um, if patients say they're just going to do the surgery on the patient, 
um, they go ahead and do one of these procedures and the normal things we do for patients who have surgery. Make sure they cough and deep breathe, pain management is achieved with the patient, looking at what is coming out of that NG tube, because that's important. When you see blood, that's something you need to contact the doctor about. Um, once they're um, recovering, you start to get bowel sounds present in the patient. They decide they're going to take the tube out. A lot of times they will leave the tube in place until after they've done this test. And what they'll do is when the patient can first or bowel sounds return, doctors say, I think I'm going to take the tube out. What they'll have the patient do is drink water, and then they'll send them to x-ray to see if there's any leaking around any of the anastomosis that were done for the patient. Same thing they do for a gastric bypass patient to make sure there's no leakage of fluid around any place that they've done surgery on the patient. After that point, uh, it's, if once they can start drinking, they'll start them on clear liquids, full liquids, just like you do with a regular diet in advance. Get the patient up moving around, walking, all the stuff you do for a patient who's post-op. The other consideration you have with gastric and esophageal cancers is they have a high mortality rate, meaning that these are cancers because they're slow growing, not having a lot of, I mean, I should say slow growing, but fast growing, but don't have complaints until you have meds. You have to make a decision about what you want to do. Because a lot of these patients are terminal when they have surgery. That's the way doctors look at it, because it has a high mortality rate. Unless you have cancer in situ, meaning you go get the cancer and it's out, most of these patients die within two years. And that's because it tends to have had meds by the time they're diagnosed. So that's part of the, it's a lot of psychosocial stuff that kind of goes along with this. Thank goodness it doesn't happen that often when you're talking about the grand scheme of things that happen with patients. But it is something that, um, when it does happen, can be um, a life-changing thing because a person doesn't always have a lot of outward symptoms that anything is going on until they start losing weight. And one of the things we all know is if you have a patient that's losing weight without trying, it's never good. It's always something bad going on. And that's what tends to happen here. So <clears throat> dumping, the surgery is done, then it becomes once they figure out what the cancer is um, sensitive to, they're going to do either chemotherapy or radiation or both for the patient. So the same kind of things you talked about in hematology that we're going to talk about again between today and tomorrow. Talk about those things you do for the patient who has, um, uh, that is going to get radiation, meaning that they're going to be someplace marked on the patient. You don't uh, wash those marks off. You just wash the skin, pat it dry, no creams, lotions, powders. Apply it to those areas. Chemotherapy is going to be, you know, you got to get rid of the cancer so the patient's going to be immunosuppressed. You got to do all things related to safety, protect them from infection. They go on what we call aplastic precautions or neutropenic precautions, meaning if they go out of the room, they put on a mask, but everybody who comes to see them wears one. Hand washing the people that come in the room, all those kind of things are going on with the patient. Now, one of the um, big uh, uh, complications that happens after this, other than the normal stuff you see with bleeding of a patient who had surgery, is dumping syndrome. Now, dumping syndrome is something that happens because part of the stomach is removed. Person starts to eat. Okay, so normally when you eat, your body's going to say, hey, release insulin. You're going to release enzymes in your stomach to digest the food. What happens with dumping syndrome is because now you have this little small area. Now, because the stomach has rugae, so it can actually enlarge. We know that because on Thanksgiving Day, we eat like a fool. And your stomach expands, all that kind of stuff. So, but the thing about it is you took out all that bulk that was now able to expand and it's not there anymore. So you eat and the transit time is now faster, meaning that you eat food and it moves down the track faster. Your body notices that you did that, that you ate, but because the food is already moving and not taking time to break down in the stomach, what you see is that you have a, what they call a hypertonic um, ball of chewed food called chyme. And it's going down the GI tract but your body, your body has released insulin to cover that. So what you do, patient has symptoms of, think about a dump truck, food is there, now it's gone. But your body responds like the food is still there. So that's the symptoms that the person gets. So you'll see all signs of symptoms like the person has hypoglycemia. So that's why they get diaphoretic, shaky, nervous, those types of things, because your body's doing this, but you have no food there. So how they treat this and how they try to tell patients, not only just for this surgery, but gastric bypass surgeries, is get rid of big plates in your house. Okay, you tell people to eat off a saucer because that makes you eat small meals. But you can't be like Dagwood because Dagwood used to stack his anyway. 
if you ever saw him, his sandwiches when he's making stuff that's like this high. So yet he did offer salsa, but the sandwich can't be that high. But you teach patients to eat off small frequent feedings is what they need to do. And the other thing is they need to separate food and water or juices or whatever it is they like to drink. If they drink, it pushes it down even faster. So you need to separate by about two hours. So if you eat at eight, then you're gonna drink at 10. If you eat at 12, then you drink at two. But not to have those things together because water actually uh, forces it out of your system even faster. It's also one of the other few times in life, uh, especially if you're African American or Latina, your parents always tell you after you eat, get up, don't lay down and sleep or none of that kind of thing. But for this person, it helps. Okay, so if you have a patient who, if they, if you suspect they have dumping syndrome because they had this happened to them before, when they eat, one of the things they should do is go lay down on their right side. It prevents food from leaving the atrium, so you have less symptoms with it. So that's one of those things that sometimes um, can help with the syndrome as well. But once a person starts uh, diligently doing small meals, that's what helps. Because that's one of the things, you've got to get rid of water. And we're so accustomed to drinking when we eat, so you don't even think about it. And so that would be something that they, has to, they have to train themselves to, to remember not to do, because that's the issue that they have. But it can be, it's one of those things that gets better, uh, usually as the patient goes along, but it can continue to happen for years after the fact, but it tends to get better. So they're not having as many episodes, but they really have to do some patient teaching to make sure they do those things. Then um, GI bleeding, we kind of talked last week about patients actually having blood products and those important things about making sure your patient, you type across patients and sign consents and all that kind of stuff. We're going to revisit that part. But um, when we think about GI bleeding, it can happen for a lot of reasons. But the most common reasons are because people take NSAIDs. So we use NSAIDs for a lot of different things. You know, we do it for arthritis. We do it just for a headache, whatever it is, patients take those. Sometimes you'll have people taking different NSAIDs, um, and this goes back to the uh, esophageal. We had a, uh, when I was at Tampa General a few years ago with students, there was a young guy who was, had, um, he was dating this girl who had like four kids. He didn't have any kids. He was like 19, 20 years old. He was dating this woman who had all these kids, and he was like trying to be the breadwinner and stuff like you do for your household. I was like, they could do, don't do it. But anyway, he's, he's doing that with somebody that he's so young to be taking off four kids. That's just to me, like, that's a lot. I mean, he may love her to death, but that's a lot for somebody that age. So he's working all, he's working three jobs to make sure he can take care of the household kind of thing. And he was taking four different NSAIDs. So he's, he's not thinking about these are additive effect kind of things. He's thinking like, I take an aspirin this morning, I take an leave in the afternoon, I take a Motrin, and I take a Tylenol. He was doing all these pills at one time. Now the Tylenol wasn't going to bother his stomach too much. That's your liver. But everything else he was taking has a big effect on the gastric mucosa where you can end up with an ulceration. I don't know how he ended up, but his, his was an esophageal tear from overuse the NSAID. So 20 years old, he's in there getting a patch done on his esophagus. You know, so people don't think about him because they think over-the-counter meds are, you know, these little things, nebulous, you don't have to worry about it, even though every single one of them has a warning on the side. So those are kind of things you have to think about. But it is one of the common reasons why you'll see patients end up with GI bleeding. The other one, of course, is trauma. So any type of, any type of patient is injured, in questions where you have people with suspected injury or they may uh, be complaining of uh, pain or uh, if they have, um, if they've been hit in a car accident or something like that, you don't always see overt bleeding, but patient may have tenderness, you start to see some changes in mentation, those things kind of lead you that something is going on in the GI tract. So you kind of think about those people that you look for at risk. There are some people that will still need the medication because there are some arthritics who cannot move unless they're taking an NSAID. So then we have to do things, goes back to MP2 about how you treat them because the other part of that is you have to make sure patients understand how to use their medications when they take them. Taking them with food lessens the effect, but we also may have to add some medications to help with healing when they have ulcerations and those types of things that are going on. So that's the person that may be on a H, the proton pump inhibitor, H2 antagonist, those things decrease acid production.
But then we also may have to give cytoprotective agents. So that's going to be like carefate that we give to the patients. We may also have, depending on what their causative agent is, and you know, if you've got a person who has H. pylori, which you see with peptic ulcers, they also get antibiotics. So that's the biaxin patient. So all of those things have to be managed as far as, you know, we got this issue going on. I know you need the NSAID, but we've got to correct whatever we can as far as teaching that patient. They also may be on antacids because, you know, that's the easy, cheap one. But then, of course, you can't always, you got to remember that those drugs have to be separated by a certain amount of time. And for the most part, they're separated anywhere from an hour to two hours, depending on what you're giving the patient. And that's mainly because the enteric coated things, <coughs> excuse me, <laughs> cannot be given with antacids. So you would not give um, Tums and um, Prilosec together. You know, that's the, that's the way that works. You can't give those medications together. The patient may be taking both of them, but you can't give them at the same time because it defeats the purpose of the medication. So those are kind of things that patients need to understand about that. Um, the other thing when you're talking about patients who have GI bleeding is, of course, we're going to try to manage it and stop it. So you locate and come CSI again, find out what the cause is. So if I think it's something because patients take a medication, that's going to be endoscopy more than likely. So the doctor's going to go down with the endo, see if there's bleeding there. The nice part about endoscopy is that, yes, I can visualize structures, but I can also treat the patient. So if I see something bleeding, the patient can have cautery, so they burn off the area there, that the patient has the irritation. And then from that, you know, we start making some strategies about how we're going to treat you so you don't have this episode again. If you have it come from a trauma, of course, that's usually a patient who's cut from here to there kind of thing, and we go in and try to figure out where this patient is bleeding. Now, remember, you have a lot of organs in there that can be problematic. Some are more vascular than others because if you have the kidneys that are the problem, they're very vascular, so patients have issues. Liver is very vascular, but the GI tract itself is also vascular, so you can have bleeding into there because you have something that ruptured or you have a penetrating wound. All, all of those things can be happening to your patient. So part of what we have to do is stay, look for the cause, stabilize the patient. You're going to give volume expanders first, so that means that I'm going to give the patient IV fluids initially, because that's what's going to help me, because that's going to increase vascular volume, maintain blood pressure, all that kind of thing. Then we have to type across the patient. Now you know if it's a true trauma patient, they get, they get uncross matched blood. They just get old neck, because that's what you're going to give to the person. The least amount of problems to the patient. But if I had time, I'm going to do a real type of cross. You still do a type of cross on the patient before you give them the blood. But just know, when you give them blood, they already created antibodies. So the next time you have to give them blood, you're going to have to type across them again. Okay. So um, patients going to get uh, blood component therapy. And for the most part, we talk about GI bleeding, they are going to get RBCs. There's no blood comes in a lot of different things. Okay. You can give them just RBCs. You can give platelets, you can give whole blood. All of those things are, are, you can give factors based on if the patient needs something else. So different component therapy. Even when you give Rogaine, that is a blood product. So you have to have two nurses identify the patient too. So I mean, hopefully you got a chance to give somebody one of those shots when you were in PD. But um, in the OB section, because that's where they give that. But that is something that um, also requires two nurses to identify the patient because it is a blood product. So one of the things you have to do if you're going to be giving this patient a blood product, remember you're going to get your consent signed. If it's a trauma patient, those are the only people that we don't really think about that. But if it's an average Joe in the hospital doing some other stuff and they have GI bleeding, then you're going to actually do your uh, type, uh, type and cross for the patient after you get your consent. The doctor may come in here and say, I want you to type and cross this patient for four units of blood. Give two now. So the patient's been tightly crossed, make sure you have a good IV, make sure you've done your vital signs before you go get your blood product, infuse it slowly. Two people have to go in and identify the patient when you go give the patient the blood uh, so that you can make the identification. Start at about 50 mLs per hour for the first 15 minutes, and then you can increase your rate of infusion, and then you do your vital signs based on your uh, hospital protocol. The vast majority of people who have uh, transfusion reactions usually happen in the first 15 minutes. Like I said, I make sure every, I'm done with everybody else so I can be in there, do that, let it run 15 minutes, do my first set of vitals on the blood, and then I turn it up and then I'm out of there to check on other folk and then come back. 
The major reason being is that if you have a patient, um, if we don't do one of those things that is going on with the patient, that's when we end up making transfusion errors. And like I said, they end up still being in the top 10 net errors every single year. So it's one of those things that we don't do to make sure that the patient doesn't have a problem. So know that your blood product can only hang for four hours max. So if you get a good IV site, a number 20 or 18, you should be fine. 22s will still run it, but it just takes a little longer. Always think about the age of your patient. If they're a little older, infuse slower, because that's the person that's going to have a problem if you give them too much volume. And the thing about it is the molecular weight of blood is different from saline and that kind of stuff. So that's why patients can have a problem. You think, oh, I gave the liter of fluid and they're not having a problem, but I only gave 300 mL of blood, and it's because the molecular weight is different. So a lot of times when people are older, doctors will write an order to give Lasix in between the units just for that reason. They need the cells, but they don't need the volume. So doctors will sometimes write that for your patient. Um, one of the other things when you're given um, transfusions, especially if you're talking about a person who uh, we're looking at their lab work to see whether or not we should give a transfusion in the first place. Most places don't transfuse patients unless their hemoglobin is below 9. And uh, most truly now have got, taken it down to eight. You know, they'll say that I'm not even going to try to give you a blood product until you get that low. Mainly because, yes, you're low, you feel bad, but I can give you medications to help build you up. And how long does it take to build RBCs? To renew your stores? 120 days. 120 days. So it's, I know you're going to feel tired for a little while, but I'm going to give you stuff to help you get to that point. Because I can give you Epigen, I can give you iron tablets. I'm going to do some dietary instruction about telling you to eat things high in iron, uh, copper, bees, all the B vitamins, all those things help you build RBC so that you have to tell patients about eating a well-rounded diet. One of the other things to think about as a nurse is that when you're looking at patients H and H, hey, because you talk about I'm giving this because the patient has GI bleeding, it is not always evident to, for hours later how far the drop is. Because I can stand in front of you and, and throw up in a basin, and you see the blood, and the basin is full, but if you did my lab work right now, it would be okay. It takes your body time to register that you lost that. So that's why when you have patients who have suspected GI bleed, you notice that they're doing H and H's every six hours or every four hours. They're doing that for a reason, because you don't catch it when it first happens. You catch it later, because your body then signals that, yes, you don't have that. The one thing you want to see happening in a patient, as far as their lab work goes, the H and H is low, so you got to bring it back up. But when you look at the retic count, if that is high, that's a good thing. Those are immature RBCs, which tells you that the bone marrow has already been stimulated to start building more RBCs. So that's a good thing. You don't ever want to see that in a sickle cell patient, but you really want to see it in somebody who has a GI bleed. Right? So you want to make sure they do all of that. Um, and then it becomes making sure you monitor the patient for signs and symptoms of reaction with the blood product. So if they have a fever, that's the febrile reaction. If you have a patient who has a um, uh, hemolytic reaction, they will complain of back pain and their urine starts to get red. So you see tea colored urine, nice and, it was nice and yellow before, now it's starting to get tea colored and then they have red urine. This is something because the kidneys themselves are being destroyed by an antigen antibody response. But the big thing they complain about is my back is killing me. So if you have any type of reaction, make sure you stop. And anaphylaxis, of course, you know the person can't breathe. That's the person that, that's the most obvious, I think, of all <laughs> reactions when patients have it, because you're going to see it. And they're not always alert to the blood. Sometimes they're alert to citrates, which is used to preserve blood products. So one of the things you want to make sure you do with any type of reaction, turn the blood off, make sure you and disconnect it because you need to make sure you have a good IV site that you just have normal saline, but you want to make sure it has a good IV site because you may have to give medications. Okay? 